Please bow your heads with me as we pray to open the service. Our Heavenly Father, it is my privilege to be here before you today to give a message about your holy word and what it means for our lives. I thank you, Lord, for the object lessons you've given me this week, the things I've been able to learn in nature. Lord, help me to apply those lessons because I know your goal is that I would be like your son, Jesus. We pray in his name this morning. We ask for your Holy Spirit because we know that you are going to bring us home in the right condition at the right time. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So Stacy and I have been pretty slammed with uh, trying to move in. Uh, seems like nothing has gone right, but uh, we had made some plans to go visit our friends up in Sutton's Bay, Michigan, uh, a while back, and we didn't want to cancel with them. So I took a vacation day, and we went up there to the Traverse City area because they are commercial cherry farmers, and uh, they have a wonderful orchard, thousands of trees, and they're still considered a small farmer, but uh, they have us up, and we like to go watch the process of harvesting the cherries and doing some picking as well. So I, I, messaged, I made my message title Lessons from the Orchard because Stacy and I saw so many wonderful things that the Lord is teaching us through being out in the agricultural environment, being out in the fresh air, and uh, I'd like to share what we learned today. Um, little fact here, the state of Michigan <clears throat> grows 70% of the total supply of tart cherries in the United States. It's a huge number. 70% of the tart cherries are made right here in our state. Uh, they're the number one producer of tart cherries in the world. Michigan is the highest producer. And uh, the Cherry Bay Orchard Company, also based in Sutton Bay, uh, are the largest commercial cherry producer in the world. So we have a fantastic um, uh, point in our, in our uh, state here uh, in the cherry industry. Uh, and one of the Cherry Bay uh, properties is right next door to our friend's place. Now, the 2023 season expected to produce 230 million pounds of cherries. 230 million pounds of tart cherries. It's a huge harvest. Uh, the sweet cherry production is smaller. It's expected to be about 50 million pounds. But that's a combined total cherry production of 280 million pounds of cherries. Just absolutely amazing. I didn't know that until I, I started going up to, uh, to visit our friends. So how do you get 280 million pounds of cherries off of the trees? Because it's a very short cycle. There's like four weeks to get them off. And that's a lot of cherries to pull off trees. So we learned a lot by going up there, but they have this machine called a shaker. And it's an amazing little machine, if you've ever seen it work. It not only drops all the cherries off the tree, but it catches them and conveys them up and puts them in a nice big box. And uh, I'm going to show you some details of all that and how it works. Um, we've got a couple of pictures here of the, some of the cherry trees. If the elder can bring that up. And uh, here you can see how how they just look like clusters of grapes. They're just large, and it's just so nice to see how a professional cherry farmer grows cherries because we have a cherry tree, and we get like, you know, nothing, basically. But uh, they're just gorgeous and uh, very flavorful, so it's a lot of fun to go out there and pick because basically what the shaker doesn't get, they say goes to waste. So they say, come on up and pick whatever you want. So we get to go up and just... He said, bring three or four coolers this year because I've got some small trees I can't shake and I don't want them to go to waste either. So we really had fun picking. Um, we're going to go to the next video here. And uh, this is just a, a sample of a tart cherry tree and how abundant the harvest can actually be. This is the way fruit can grow when it's done right. Just loaded and loaded and loaded with cherries. Like this vine here. I've never seen it quite like this. 
the whole tree, wherever you look, is just full. Cherries, tree after tree after tree, all the way down. Incredible. Amen. So I don't know about you, but I was amazed when I stood under these those trees and just saw how much fruit one tree can produce. So much fun. Um, but the shaker has a very unique uh, process here, and I'm going to play this video here. I actually had a chance to ride on the shaker and, uh, and watch it work from above, so I, I took a video of exactly how it works. So uh, watch this and see how many, notice how many cherries are up there on the branches, and just watch all of them come down here. Yeah, it's a pretty neat tool because there's these large posts with rubber around them that grabs the tree so it doesn't harm it. Uh, it puts a lot of pressure on it, but then those bat wings come around and uh, catch everything that falls safely and softly. And then the conveyors, of course, bring it up. And then you see a second conveyor here that takes it over the little box. I'll show you a picture of the box in the next video. But uh, just fantastic to see that many cherries coming off that fast. It takes about an hour to pick a tree like that by hand, they say. And as you can see, it's about 15 seconds to, uh, to strip it all, the, the, the cherries. Um, so um, this particular machine was called the Shockwave. And uh, the uh, the machine itself, uh, it's extremely powerful. It's a big diesel engine. Uh, but I've got one more video here that shows the box where all the cherries go in. That box full of cherries weighs 1,100 pounds. And uh, the next one you can see pretty good is we're back on to the, uh, the, the tart cherries now. The ones before were the golden cherries, and those were actually used uh, as they, they, they dye them uh, red after they, they harvest them, and they're called maraschino cherries, as you see in the story. You can pause it right there, Charles. That little red box there, though, uh, once they fill that box up, it's very important to get the, the fruit, which is fragile, it's warm, it's in the sun, and they got to take it to a place called a cooling station. And at that cooling station, uh, they actually load those boxes up with 52 degree groundwater to cool them down. And that does two things, he said. It not only um, preserves the, the cherry, but it also allows the cherry to firm up and allows it to get transported quickly to the processing station so they don't get bruised. And that's very important because they look through them and if there's bruises on the cherries or there's sticks or stems, then they have to, uh, they get dinged on the amount per pound that they give them. So very important part of the process is the cooling station. Uh, we got one more, go ahead and play that Charles. But, um, these individual squares here is one of those boxes. These particular ones were white here. Um, but that particular uh, morning, uh, they did about, I don't know, they loaded the cooling station up here with all these boxes about three times just in one morning. So uh, lots and lots of cherries that the, uh, the machine can take off. And there's one more video here to, uh, to finalize our, our journey up to Traverse City. Emperor Francis. Emperor Francis. See him up here? There's clusters and clusters and clusters. Clusters and clusters. Left over after the shaker went. This is what the shaker left behind. I'm going to talk a little bit about why the shaker leaves some cherries behind and doesn't shake them all. Because sometimes it does 100%. Last days when the shaking happens, freshest fruit will be left behind that Jesus will come and harvest. And that will be us. And we will be like little jewels, just like these little cherries are like little jewels. So the spiritual shaking is happening now. And the fruit is becoming visible. Yes, it is. Let's be some of that fruit. 
Stacy was preaching kind of a sermon there. I didn't want to leave it out. <laughs> All right, but uh, a lot of uh, a lot of processing goes into it here, and we learned a lot of things. And the first object lesson I'd like to talk about from the orchard is that the signs of the shaking, the shaking are happening right now in our church. And uh, this this process reminded me so much in so many ways of the shaking that's happening in the church right now. Because God is going to continue to shake, just like the cherry tree, until his people are developing a character like Christ. The shaking is actually needed for us to develop our character. And uh, when God's ready to process his precious fruit and gather it together, we will be ready. But like the shaker, which has the task of, of, of harvesting a multitude of cherries, there's a multitude of people out there. So the shaking is going to be continuous until the Lord says we're ready. The uh, great harvest of the earth is what we talked about in our scripture reading. We'll get to that in a minute. But the second object lesson from the orchard is that the shaking can be painful. When we first got up there, uh, my dad uh, my dad, and mom came with us this year. And uh, we were sitting next to a tree and we were getting to know. Uh, I was introducing my dad to the owner. And... Uh, my dad looked down and he noticed, like, why is that bark on that tree so badly cracked? And he said, that's the shaker. He said, if you put too much pressure on it, he goes, we had to learn how to use the shaker. And if you put too much pressure on it, you can actually twist the bark on the tree and then it will get sick and dry and it will crack like that. And he didn't kill the tree. The tree was still viable. It was still producing fruit. But uh, he said, the shaker can damage the trees and it can be a painful part of the process but as you can see it's still extremely necessary to do the shaker Uh, and a lot of things in our life are like that we we go through these trials we actually receive damage even sometimes to ourselves but the lord is trying to move us into a certain direction with the trials in our life and he's willing to damage us a little bit in order to make us ready for the harvest So, the next time you're feeling shaken, remember the Lord is working on us, and sometimes these shakings are necessary. So, um, in uh, in the final analysis, we have to remember the shaking is from Jesus. He is the one doing all the shaking in our lives, even though it looks like maybe the person across the hall from us is doing the shaking, right? Or maybe they are taking it upon themselves to try and shake somebody up. But Jesus is going to bring the trials into our lives. He doesn't need help from us. So we want to make sure we remember that when the shaking comes, to go to our knees and ask the Lord to help us through it because we know he's trying to make us better and the shaking will never kill us. So I know a lot of people's lives have deep scars from trials and and tragedy that has happened but the lord promises us he's with us in each and every single one and if it means bringing the fruits of the spirit out in each one of us he's willing to apply it the nine fruits of the spirit love peace joy long suffering right that can be a difficult one to do long suffering but kindness gentleness faithfulness self-control The Lord is trying to develop all these things in us and he's going to shake his church until we respond and and adopt these principles. So as the Lord is purifying us, we have to remember that this is important and not worry about all that other stuff that comes into the play when we're trying to uh, get through the busy time in our life. And, you know, people in church don't always get along sometimes. But we have to remember that Maybe the person who is having trouble being gentle and kind is in your life because the Lord is trying to get you to develop patience, right? So what the other person is lacking in the fruits of the Spirit, you're lacking in other things. And when God puts us together, if we work through it, we both get better, amen? So this is kind of the analogy I saw in the, in the shaking because so much fruit comes in. God's going to be faithful in his harvest. He is going to bring us home. But the truth of the matter is, we have got to be made ready first. So, can you say amen for trials? Some people not so sure. 
All right. But you know, the first temptation Christ faced in the wilderness was over appetite, being able to have self-control. But even Christ himself relied on the word of God. It is written. He went to the Bible to defend against the devil. And of course, the other temptations of being able to control people and being on the top of the world, even though Jesus was there, he was the son of God, he went to the word of God. And that's where we gain our strength from. So as God is shaking us, we will get through. And you know, friends, even though we may lose all of our beautiful branches in this world, we may lose everything beautiful and luxurious in our life, but God's people will be known by their fruit. By your fruit, you will be known as a follower of Christ. So the shaking of the earth will precede the great harvest, and the unfaithful will be shaken out, and the faithful will get shaken in. And uh, let's go to our scripture reading now before we go to our third object lesson. Revelation 14.14 14. And thank you, Levi, for reading. We missed you last, last Sabbath when you weren't here. But Revelation 14 and verse 14 talks about harvesting the earth. And we read, Then I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you to reap, for the harvest of the earth is ripe. So prophecy is telling us that the harvest of the earth is ripe. We know the time frames. We know that we are in the end of days. And this time is, is, is the time where Christ is coming in and doing some sharp cutting. And it may feel like we're getting sharply cut. But it's not only cutting down the unfaithful, but it's cutting free the faithful. So I want to talk about our third object lesson that we learned from the orchard. And that is that cherries can't be too far away from the trunk. When we were there, and I, we were showing you some of the, the trees and the cherries that were left over after the shaking, a lot of times what happens is the, the branches grow too far away from the trunk. So when the shaker starts shaking, the vibration doesn't make it out there all the way, and they can't actually grab the cherries. So they stay on the vine, and they rot. They're never actually gathered in harvest. The other example was where the branch went too far out, but it was sternly connected to the trunk. And when the shaker would go, they were outside of the protective netting. And we were there watching and we were horrified because like what was going over the side of the bat wings was more cherries than we can get in a whole year just from one tree, you know. So we're watching this like waterfall of cherries just falling into the ground. And we're like, wait, 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 we'll go pick them up, you know. And the tractor just ran them right over, crushed them. And it's kind of a, a difficult thing when we see that many beautiful, ripe, perfect cherries just being run over and crushed. But that's how the Lord feels when he's done all he could do to gather the fruit. And yet people are just leaving the church. They're falling to the ground. And the Bible says they're going to be crushed in the wine press. And um, I, was, uh, I was thinking of, of these perfectly ripe cherries, and uh, they're falling into the path. And, you know, it wasn't just the, the tractor that would crush them. The, the shaker itself was crushing the, tree, the, the cherries that would fall. And uh, the truth is, it's hard to go into the grass and pick them all out. It's real time-consuming. The grass is long. It's not really always cut in the center of the thing. And picking them up is difficult because you're trying to sort through sticks and cherries that are rotten, that have been there before. So it really is just a loss when they can't gather those cherries. So um, the, uh, the other side of the great harvest is kind of spoken of here where the people are lost in uh, verse 18. If you go with me down to verse 18. 
It says here, and another angel came out from the altar who had power over fire, and he cried with a loud cry to him who had a sharp sickle, saying, thrust in your sharp sickle and gather the clusters of the vine of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. So the angel thrust his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and threw it into the great winepress of the wrath of God. So here is a a biblical example of the of the lost cherries, I guess. And you'll notice here that there's a harvest here. This particular harvest is of the vine of the earth. Now, this is what happens to a what happens to something that goes into a wine press, by the way, right? What, what, is, what do they do with a wine press? They press the grapes together to crush them, right? So this is referring to those people in the end of time who are not gathered by the Lord, who are going to be crushed. They're going to be destroyed. And it's just like those cherries that didn't make it into the harvesting of the Lord. This... Uh, this example here from Revelation is borrowed from an ancient Palestinian agricultural year where there was a grain harvest and a vintage harvest. And uh, the grain of the grapes, the grain and the grapes were both gathered by a sickle, but the grain was stored in the barns while the grapes were crushed into a wine press. And it's a perfect example of the saved and the lost. But the passage tells us that Jesus will crush the wicked on judgment day. Wicked men and women who have come out of their deception, who refuse to come out of their deception, will be outside of the protective arms of judgment on that day. So the Lord is still working on them. We have to remember that we don't know who is going to be there and who is not. Who's going to be without, within the, the reach of the gathering and those who are going to be outside of it. Because many, many people will make a decision at the last moment and it may be through us. He may be coming through you to bring someone the precious knowledge of Jesus Christ. So we can be the ones making a difference in our community on the harvest. And you know, they were telling us that a cherry tree requires about three to five years, even sometimes seven years before it can actually bear fruit. It's a lot of work. It's weeding. It's, it's making sure the diseases are gone. It's, it's, there's so much that goes into it. They have, to, they have to maintain the road system around the cherry trees. And it's just like there's just a, a year's worth of work just to get to that one point that we were watching. And, you know, it's like that with us. When someone is a new believer, it may take them three, five, six, seven years before they're actually able to walk somebody through a set of Bible lessons and bring them to the Lord. But we have to love people. We have to, we have to nurture them. We have to provide them in an environment. It's like that cooling station. If those cherries aren't put into an environment where they can be preserved, they will spoil. And God's people are just like that precious, fragile fruit. We've got to take care of them right away. We've got to get them into the environment where they can be preserved. And uh, the Lord is asking us to be ready to, uh, to give fruit and bear fruit. And the question today is, are we willing? Uh, but as you know, um, the, one of the most difficult things we can do is to master self-control. And the, uh, the cooling station was a good example of mastering self-control. Like the cherries uh, instantly get hot when you take them off. Because if you notice, the cherries were a lot of times surrounded by leaves. And those leaves are actually act as shade for the, for the cherry. And then when the cherry is picked and it's out in the sun, it's amazing how fast it gathers heat. And it's the same way. The devil is on us as soon as we make a decision for the Lord. The heat is on as soon as someone starts walking towards Jesus. And it's our job as a church to be kind of like that cooling station, to get them into a safe environment where they can be preserved. So fantastic lessons that we could see happening that was relevant and paralleled to the gospel. Um, but we want to develop a safe place for people to, uh, to develop in the Lord. Um, so the fourth object lesson we learned is the danger of being a non-producer. And uh, can you imagine, he has, he has thousands of cherry trees. He didn't really even know how many cherry trees he had. Um, but wouldn't it be amazing to go through all this work and have no cherries at the end, right? 
So God is looking at us, telling, we need you to bear fruit. All of this effort for church is so that we bear fruit for the kingdom of God, so that we win souls. And uh, Jesus talks about the danger of being a non-producer, those who, are, who have not prepared the soil, who have not planted, who have not cultivated, they will not produce fruit. And in Matthew chapter 21, we have an example of a non-fruit-bearing tree. So if you go with me to Matthew chapter 21, in verse 18... Matthew 21 and verse 18. Now in the morning, as he returned to the city, he was hungry. And seeing a fig tree by the road, he came to it and found nothing on it but leaves. Very important part of the story. And said to it, let no fruit grow on you ever again. Immediately the fig tree withered away. So what's the nature of a fig tree? What's the purpose of a fig tree? It has only one purpose, it's to produce figs. And Jesus walks up to this tree, this beautiful tree, it's full of these leaves, but there's no fruit on it. And Jesus takes away its privilege of producing fruit because it was not fulfilling its purpose as a fig tree. And this story is so important because the Lord's going to remove our privilege to win souls if we don't use our resources to win souls. It's amazing how much money and effort goes into making things beautiful, right? We make our houses beautiful. We want our car to be beautiful. If our paint looks bad, we want to get a paint job on it. But so much effort goes into making things beautiful, and the Lord says, I don't know if the Lord has a problem. The Lord wants us to have a present, good presentation to things. But if all we're about is making things beautiful and there's no fruit, God treats us like that fig tree and we will wither away. On judgment day, there's a strict warning about being a non-producer. Will you be found to be a good tree or will you just be a beautiful tree with no fruit? Do you ever wonder what the Lord will say to you about the fruit you produced? Let's go to Luke 6.43. Let's look at the basic tenets of what a good fruit tree is. Luke chapter 6 and verse 43. Luke 6.43 When you're there, say amen. Okay, Jesus is speaking here. For a good tree does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. A good man out of the good treasures of his heart brings forth good and an evil man out of, his, out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. So in order to be a good tree bearing good fruit, we have to be a good tree. So the process of producing good fruit is first dependent on what the tree is made of. What's the substance of the, what is in your heart? Because that is what produces fruit. An evil man will produce evil fruit. But a good man, by the power of Jesus Christ, will produce good fruit. And isn't it reassuring that Jesus thought enough about the, the role of producing fruit that he would write it down and tell us that you cannot produce bad fruit if you're a good tree. And friends, is Jesus raising us up to be good trees or bad trees? His goal is to make us good fruit trees. And if Jesus' goal is to make you a good fruit tree, we can be assured we're not going to produce bad fruit. But it's Jesus working through us that's going to make the difference. Let's go over to uh, Luke 3, 9. Just a few chapters before. Luke chapter 3, verse 9. Let's look at the very, very sobering counsel 
that exists here about the bad trees. Luke 3.9 says, And even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree which does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. This verse suggests that being a Christian is not a passive association. The Great Commission is about action and moving forward the gospel so that people can hear it and realize the love of Christ. Christ has asked us to be part of that commission and bear that good fruit. Are we taking part in the, good, in the Great Commission? Being a Christian is not recreational. We don't just kind of casually read through the Bible to understand a few stories here and there. We are to be transformed by the Bible to become that good tree. We are a labor force of love that requires suffering, care, and feeding all the fruits of the Spirit to help other people become good trees. And when people are new to the faith, they don't know. They don't understand all the details of it. We have to be the ones to produce that understanding in their mind. And being a good fruit tree is work, don't get me wrong. But it's better than being thrown in a fire. So for me, I want to be a good fruit tree. The fifth object lesson gained from the orchard is that pruning is necessary. And Liz was talking about this a little bit today. Fruit trees, interestingly enough, have branches that grow towards the center of the tree all the time. They all, I, I prune my own fruit trees, and you always have branches that grow right to the center of the trunk. And the first rule I was taught when pruning fruit trees is to cut those branches right off. If it's growing towards the center, you just get rid of it. And I thought about that. It's like, wow, we have so many inward branches in our life. We have so many things that are always centered towards me. We always have an inward focus when we're building our, our tree, right? But the Lord says, cut those off. We need to cut loose the selfishness in our lives, the selfish tendencies. Branches on a fruit tree are made to go outward. They need to go outward. They need to get out into the sun. They need to get out where they can bear fruit. And if the problem of a, of a a bad directional branch isn't fixed, it causes difficulty for the tree. So we want to remove the bad branches. And pruning does several things. Number one, when we prune a tree, we have to remember that it's necessary. And I look at these brand new, beautiful branches, and it's hard to cut it off. I don't want to cut it off. But I've learned that when you cut that off and you allow the energy to go to the other branches, it can be a fantastic discovery of what the Lord can do when we prune. And it's just like that in our life. We've got to recognize we need pruning. We all need correction, do we not? We've all got to have some training in our life. Because when we go the wrong way, we need some sharp counsel to move us back away from our bad habits. Because if we get too far away from Jesus... When the shaking happens, we'll be shaken out of the church. Spiritual pruning is a good thing. Isaiah 48.10 says, Behold, I have refined you, but not with silver. I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. God is testing us in the furnace of affliction. And friends, affliction never seems like a good thing. But the Lord's asking us to get through some challenges. And that's how we learn. And you think about the person in your life who's irritating you the most. You're like, is this person really from the Lord or are they just, just irritating me? Sometimes the Lord puts those irritating people in our lives because we need to understand how to help them. It's not about us. It's about what we can do for them. Maybe they're irritating everybody else too. And you're the one person that's going to give them the gospel and turn them around. You're going to help them cut off that internally growing branch. And I think that's a, something to praise God about this morning. The training from the Lord makes us better if we let him work. So let's go to Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 7. On that note of pruning, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 7. If 
you went to James, you went too far. Hebrews is right after the short books, Philemon. Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 7 says, If you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. So you see, friends, the shaking is necessary. The pruning is necessary. And without it, we're not considered sons of God. He's going to give us trials to help us learn and to make us better and to make us more solid Christians. Verse 11 says, Now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Think about that. The chastening never seems joyful in the present, but by faith we know the pain is worthwhile because it will produce the peaceable fruit of righteousness. That's all we need to be ready for the great harvest is the righteousness of Christ in our life. So friends, we have to tell the Lord, give him permission, bring on the painful chastening, bring on the pruning if it makes me ready for the harvest. Proverbs 11.30 says, The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he who wins souls is wise. Part of being a good, tree, good tree, uh, fruit tree is bearing fruit, and in a spiritual sense, that means winning souls. That means bringing someone to sit in these pews. In the case of the fig tree, we cannot be idle. Fruit bearing is not an option for the Christian. And if we weren't valuable fruit, friends, would the devil be working so hard to try and spoil you? He's working full time to try and wreck you. He wants you spoiled. God's given us all the tools to preserve our Christian walk. And some of those uh, inward branches have to come off. And I'm not saying that we can't have anything um, in this world you know, if whatever you do, a lot of, if you ride bikes, go buy yourself the best bike if that's how you spend your time. If you play tennis, go buy a great tennis racket. You know, whatever you do, I always believe in buying good equipment. But if the Lord's telling you to support your church or to support a world mission somewhere or to go on a mission trip and you decide to buy your third condo on the beach in Florida, the Lord may have some branches he's going to prune from you painfully. Now, I know nobody here has three condos in Florida, but you get the point. The Lord is saying, I want you to invest in my kingdom. And um, I don't have three condos in Florida. I don't have any condos in Florida, but I do have a nice tennis racket because I like to play tennis. And uh, I think it's okay if we buy something that we, we're going to use to spend our time in recreation. But you understand the point. Our selfish attitude's got to be plain pruned off, and we need to do it without complaining because in the end we know it's yielding good fruit for us. So the last object lesson from the orchard is don't stop seeking. We can't stop seeking, and this was kind of a painful lesson for us in the orchard because we were so amazed at this cherry because we were here with the, the Emperor Francis, and then we go over here and here's the gold ones, and we go down here and here's a different flavor again altogether. And the problem was we were so busy we forgot that the owner told us, you guys can go wherever you want and pick anywhere you want. But we stayed for hours picking where the cherries were not as ripe, they were smaller, and they were not as abundant. And when we went over to the other side of the orchard, we found the trees we should have been picking from the beginning, you know. But you see, we stopped we stop seeking. We stop going through the orchard. And the truth is, Jesus has so many blessings for us down the way if we keep seeking him. We were 
done picking and we were exhausted and we went and said goodbye to our friends and because they were going to be running the shaker till late hours of the night and we were leaving and we looked and we saw this tree and I stopped the truck and I looked at Stacy and we're like oh yeah we got to grab that one because it was just amazing how big they were and we looked around and they were all like that and if we just would have came over earlier if we would have kept searching you know, rather than being satisfied with just what was in front of us. Now, I say that because the Lord doesn't want us to stop reading our Bible. He doesn't want us to stop praying. He doesn't want us to stop working with the fellowship of believers. That's what makes the difference. But you can miss out on some of the sweetest experiences if we stop seeking Jesus. Psalm 119 says, How sweet are your words to my taste, sweeter than honey to my mouth. But how often are we satisfied with the few blessings we received and we stop? We don't want our Christian walk to fade into a superficial experience. When we stop walking, we stop studying. The Lord wants us to spend quality time with Him so our minds stay firm and preserved, just like those cherries. So, Mrs. White had a comment on this in the book Education. She says, Many, even in their seasons of devotion, fail of receiving the blessing of real communion with God. They are in too great of a haste. With hurried steps, they press through the circle of Christ's loving presence, pausing perhaps a moment within the sacred precincts, but not waiting for counsel. They have no time to remain with the divine teacher. With their burdens, they return to their work. Education, page 260 and 261. So we have to spend that precious time with Jesus. And brothers and sisters, God created you to be a good fruit tree to bear fruit. Amen? Beautiful, shiny, healthy fruit. And we are going to win souls for the kingdom in this church. I believe it. And when we get assailed by the devil, how are we going to fix it? We're going to call on the word of God, just like Jesus did. That's the power of that Satan cannot stop. So, the truth is, the only thing stopping our fruit production, the only thing stopping it from winning souls, is that we're stopping God's hand from pruning us. We need to stop that resistance and start being ready for the shaking that's coming. So, I ask you today, friends, are you considered the chastening in your life? Is there anything that the Lord is trying to remove from your life that you're resisting? All of our attitudes could use a little affliction, affliction and correction, and uh, I am I'm definitely acknowledging that. Uh, but we need to admit what we're struggling with, repent, and let the Lord train us as disciples. That's what's going to build us into these fruit trees. So, friends, are you willing to allow Jesus to do some pruning in your life? Do you give him permission to do some cutting? Not so sure, huh? It's difficult to ask for pruning, I understand. But there's anyone here today who wants to know how to lead someone to Jesus. Maybe you've never led someone to Jesus before. Maybe you've never walked someone through a Bible study. But if you want to be a good tree, he wants us to bear fruit for his kingdom. And he who wins souls is wise. So if there's anybody out there today who's willing to be pruned and would like to bear fruit, I just ask you to raise your hand. Because I'm going to put together a class maybe on how to give a Bible study so that we can learn how to teach people about Jesus and bring them into the safety of the church.